Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. This show is sponsored by 35 Ways to Brighten Up Your Day. I created this ebook that you can download instantly at brightenyourdays.com to help you have more fun and create more joy by building the habits of taking simple, intentional, empowering action every day, bite-sized inspiration and action steps to brighten your day. It starts with you deciding you're going to be happy and have more fun, and this will lead you to a brighter future. Get it today for yourself or someone special in your life and support the show by going to brighterdays.com. All right. Well, welcome listeners to the Make Life Fun show. I am so excited to have you here and listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. Today on the show, I have Dr. Lisa Smith with us, and she is going to be talking to us about a topic that is very personal to me, as you guys have been here for a while, have heard my story. And so this topic to me is very much a topic that needs to be discussed, needs to be heard, and we need to have the awareness of it. And I'm so thankful to have you here, Dr. Lisa Smith to talk to us. So welcome to the show. Thank you so very much for having me. I'm so grateful. You've been so gracious to talk about this important topic and I'm really happy to be here. Yes. So we're just going to jump in. Just go ahead and let us have it. Let us know exactly what it is you do and what is lighting you up and what it is that you're passionate about and why this topic in particular. Sure. So I'm Dr. Lisa Smith and I run a sex crime reporting website that also provides resources, tips, for parents, their children, their teens, and those who are seeking help for sexual violence or or victimized by sexual violence. What lights me up is spreading this message so that we can reduce the numbers. Right now, we have one in four girls and one in six boys. And I really believe that that is a much higher rate, Mm -hmm. especially when we start looking at race or the intersectionality of that. And also when we start looking at who's reporting, right? Mm -hmm. Because that is the biggest issue. And so it has to be a grassroots effort. We can't expect a national policy. Mm -hmm. We have to start reporting because only five out of a thousand offenders are prosecuted, right? So that means 995 are undetected. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Yeah, that's the Right? Oh, that's the that's the scary part. And that's why we need the knowledge. So if we are speaking with the moms here on the Make Life Fun show, and we want to just give them a overall what to feel, what to know about this topic, a pathway to what they should do. Sadly, I want them to be proactive. I want them to know the potential signs Mm -hmm. so that they're not, their child isn't victimized. That is why this is so very important Mm -hmm. because we don't want to be reactive. We want to be proactive because I always ask people, well, which child are you willing to sacrifice for not having the information, right? And most people are like, I'm not willing to sacrifice any child. Yeah, absolutely. Great. That's that's what I need all parents to mm-hmm. think. It is much harder to help a child with their sexual identity after the fact. Mm-hmm. And sexual identity is not sexual orientation. That's mm-hmm. important. And so for going in it and we're talking to prevention, we're talking about prevention and being proactive with our kids. Where do we even begin? Like, sure. where do we start? <laughs> so first, we want to get rid of that stranger danger information, mm-hmm. right? Because 93% of those that are sex offenders are known. They're acquaintances of the family. They bring wine to dinner. They come for Christmas mm-hmm. celebrations. They are your the coach, the teacher. They are somebody the child knows, okay? Mm-hmm. And so, so only 7% are unknown right? Mm -hmm. So prevention says that we teach kids scenarios as young as possible, Mm -hmm. right? Because we have cases. I had, I had someone contact me on Instagram and tell me her four-year-old was being abused by her father. 
mm-hmm. right? And they were divorced. And so this was a court mandated visitation. And so please don't think that your child is too young for this mm-hmm. to happen. To you. Remember the offender and the predator, because they're not the same, mm-hmm. looks for vulnerability, right? And that means how vulnerable is this child? And more importantly, how accepting are they mm-hmm. of the suggestions? Mm-hmm. So I tell parents to introduce scenarios. And my books do that very easily because it helps us have the conversations mm-hmm. about a scenario that they're reading about. And now we have this fruitful discussion discussion that comes from it. And every year there needs to be this consistent conversation Mm -hmm. about new scenarios that child can find themselves in. And so before the age of eight, especially if we're just talking about boys and their reporting, this is why I think is such a problem because boys don't report Mm -hmm. and they don't report at the rates that girls do. And many of these children are being sexually assaulted before the age of eight. The stats will tell you under the age of 10, but many parents will tell you, I don't expect to have the sex talk with my child until they're eight. Yeah, that's what you think. And you grow up hearing the word stranger danger, stay away from people that you know. So the fact that you're speaking of like, you have to be aware of the people in your home. So how do we become aware of the people that are coming in our home? Because obviously if they're in our homes, we have some level of trust. We have some level of thinking this person is a safe person to invite into our home. And so how do we even begin to begin to know? It's a beautiful question, right? How do we protect our children from their siblings? How do we, basically this is what you're saying. How do we check? How do we protect that child from their dad or their mom or the babysitter that's there five days a week? And so this is through conversation and discussion. First, that child needs to know a beautiful word, Mm -hmm. not just no. A beautiful phrase is no. And I'm going to tell mommy you touched right? I'm not going to keep your secret. These are phrases that that child must adopt because remember that offender, usually when we talk about offenders, we're talking about maybe once, maybe twice, but when we're talking about a predator, we're talking about systematic, right? So we're talking about different children in different areas and different institutions Mm -hmm. that have been approached by this predator, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll move around from an institution to an institution. That means if they're a track coach, they'll move from school to school. If they're a Boy Scout leader, they'll move from troop to troop. If it's a cousin that only visits in the summer, right? The child might be sexually assaulted on a camping trip, or if they're not camping on a trip to out of state, but because that parent is so trusting of that cousin, that cousin might be 14 and has access to the Mm -hmm. five-year-old. Right. So that means that your child must have these conversations about body boundaries. Mm-hmm. Now, there are wonderful books out there on body boundaries, mm-hmm. and we can have these conversations. But we can also add that if someone says, I want to touch you here, you must tell me immediately, even if I'm in a bad mood, mm-hmm. even if you don't think I'm going to do anything. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the other thing is that your child should be able to trust you. If a child does not feel comfortable talking to you, two things may have happened. That sex offender may have said, I'm going to hurt your mom if you say anything. Mm -hmm. So those conversations need to be discussed broadly. If they ever say that they can hurt me, I'm not afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm a superhero. And if you can't tell me, you tell your friend, because my book's teach kids to rely on other kids Mm -hmm. because they feel as okay he said I didn't I couldn't say anything (laughs) but what if I tell what if I tell my neighbor's mom who listens to Mm -hmm. me what if I tell my best friend and beg her to tell her mother Mm -hmm. because in one of my books Chad is being sexually assaulted by his soccer coach and we don't go into detail about what that means Mm -hmm. I show the symptoms Mm -hmm. Right, that child would not want to be touched. If they have real strict boundaries about you seeing them alone and they didn't before, Mm -hmm. or they seep into a depression, or they start hitting and acting out, or they start using words that you would never dream they're using. I'm talking about provocative words about anal sex or that they would have only learned from that offender. Mm -hmm. Okay. They generally will mimic 
what they're exposed to. So let's say it's not an adult. Let's say it's another child in their classroom. So if we're going to prevent this, we cannot stop the child who's being exposed to it, who brings pornography to school. We know six-year-olds bring guns. Mm -hmm. If they bring pornography to school, if they're on a play date and it's a sleepover, that child needs to know, call me at any time if you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And don't leave the phone. Ask whoever is has the phone, whatever parents there, because it's important to know that, you know, sometimes sleepovers, the person who has the phone is the person who's abusing them. Mm. One thing I tell young kids is one way to get out of that house is to put your clothes on and leave and go next door. Mm. If that abuser or offender is the responsible adult, Okay. I tell them you can easily lock yourself in the bathroom Mm -hmm. or lock yourself in the room or tell them I have to go to the bathroom. I really need to go to the bathroom and I want to go by myself, Mm -hmm. but I'll be back for kids because many parents allow kids to have um, phones. Mm -hmm but some schools take them away. If that's the case, then you get to an adult that is outside of the house. Yes. So all those ways of knowing, all those ways of talking to your kids and building the trust with the kids and knowing your, basically knowing your child so that when they're acting out, like not the way they are, you know, that there's something that you need to investigate deeper. So now that we've talked about prevention and a little bit about the awareness piece, how do we help the kids? Because you said 93% are known. That's a huge number. So how can we start to advocate for these kids? How can we start to heal and help them heal? You're asking about after assault, right? Yeah, because now we've talked about prevention a little bit. And so now I'm like, how do we help these kids that are 93% are known? Different for each stage, right? Because we use play therapy when they're under 10. Because one of the symptoms of sexual assault is depression, sometimes selective mutism. So they might stop talking and they might stop talking to you and they may stop talking to others. So we use play therapy so they can write the stories Mm -hmm. out. But the most important thing I tell parents is when your child comes to you and tells you this has happened, many people institutions experience what we call dis theory. I write about that in my book for parents, the blame and shaming of defenseless victims in America's rape culture. Dis theory means denial, inaction, information suppression. So depending on who the offender is, some parents may deny that it's happened. They don't believe their child. The first thing I say is believe your child when they say it the first time, not the second time, not the third time, because you're leaving them vulnerable for a second event. Okay. So believe them. Then the question is, who was it? Right. Because a lot of the reasons why we don't report is because it's daddy and daddy is a income provider for that household. So to report it means that the family dynamic is going to be exposed and that income may potentially be lost. I've had mothers curse me out because if they report it, and I'm a mandatory reporter, I have to. Mm -hmm. The investigation starts and ends with me, Mm -hmm. right? They might lose housing. They might get kicked out. I had a case where one of the girls, she was a teen and they were living in an aunt's home and her husband, the aunt's husband, the uncle would come home, fondle her because she slept on the couch and touch her and have his beer and then go into the room with his wife. And so her mom cursed me out Mm -hmm. and said, you're going to cause us to lose our housing. So Mm -hmm. the second issue is in action. Mm -hmm. This theory is D-I-I-S, denial. No, this couldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. In action. I'm not going to do anything. And information suppression, I'm not going to tell anyone, Mm -hmm. right? So that's how undetected offenders remain undetected. So what does that mean? If that is someone who's an income provider or a place where you find refuge and it's housing, what do you do? 
One, if you must remain in the house, your child can no longer be alone with that individual. Not for any reason, not at any time. Yeah. Because I'm going to be honest with you, there are situations where they have to stay. There are situations where they'll come in and investigate. And because it was just fondling, there is no DNA evidence to collect. And so they will leave the child in the house. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to get counseling. So if you and your child have to remain in this space, one, you have to alert other children and their parents who are in a, and around yes. this offender. Now let's say it's your son or your daughter, right? Because I have a case five years old, grandma will go to the supermarket for an hour and his 11 year old cousin would come, a five-year-old boy would come fondle him and touch him and also ask him to touch her. So both are being pleasured at the same time. And he didn't think anything was wrong with it because he's so young, mm -hmm. cognition, but it felt good, right? So there are a lot of cases where children, because they're not cognitively aware of what's allowed and what's not, they'll think that this is okay and it mm -hmm. feels good. And so they can continue it and they will keep the secret because they are receiving a reward. It's horrible mm -hmm. to say it that way, but they are receiving pleasure from it. So why would they want to stop yeah. that? But for many of my cases, they're like, listen, this is something that happened since I was the age of four. And I just assumed everybody mm -hmm. in their family was being exposed. This happens in every family. Mm -hmm. And so I never thought that this was wrong until I got into classes or I watched some program. And so the other thing about the naivete of young children is that they don't know what mm -hmm. the sexual protocols are. And I'm not asking you as a parent to teach that. What I am asking you to teach them is these harmful scenarios mm -hmm. that make them victims, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. And it definitely, it brings up for me the fact that this is traumatic. So for the child, it may not be traumatic in the moment, like you were saying, because they just don't know. And so it truly is that preventative, like that preventative is like, to me, that's in my mind, what we have to strive for 100%. Like I said, we must be proactive because to be reactive means that it's already happened. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And so we want to reduce those numbers. Yes. And, and what makes somebody at risk? What makes beautiful them? question? Love that question. <laughs> I can't wait to tell you. So we have children. It was called latchkey kids in my time, but we have parents who two incomes, they're not at home. Children come home from school. They let themselves into the house. They get their food. They start their homework. And so a lot of offenders will look at maybe single parent homes where the child is alone mm -hmm. for certain hours. And there's a need there. They will look for those inconsistencies where mm -hmm. this child is not being monitored all the time. Yeah. right? Or this child is left alone by themselves, or this child's parents are not available. They don't show up to track meets. They don't come to, to cheerleading. They're not there. And so someone else is responsible for them. Another parent might take them home. And so, like I said, there is an inconsistency there because if it is a predator or if it's an offender, they're going to know this child's routine. Mm -hmm. So I'm always cautious of telling parents, listen, no one should really know that your child is home alone and your child really shouldn't tell their friends either. Because a lot of times those sex offenders come through the door because an older sibling invited them in because mom's not home or dad's not home. When we start talking about how does a person gain access, people would say this is being strict. You need a closed home until that child can speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about, sure, there were many kids that came to my home and they weren't abusive, but we don't know that. We can't gauge that. And basically what we're saying is we're asking a child to gauge that because the parents don't know mm -hmm. and the parents won't be home. Play dates. I always talk about play dates. And I hope I'm answering your question. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, I always talk about play dates, right? So the child should be able to come to the house, but people don't understand. You need to do background checks. 
because the, the sexual assault registry is available in every community. Mm-hmm. Just because a new family moves in and the parents are really friendly, you don't know the reason why they left the other area. Mm-hmm. And so many people do not look at the sex registry. If you have any feeling, that gut feeling is something you should pay attention to. Yeah. And, you know, I have family members who are like, yes, since I was sexually assaulted, no, my children won't have play dates. Now, I wouldn't go that far, but I say have play dates in open spaces where there are other kids and there are other parents and everybody like the trampoline places or the parks where everybody can be monitored and nobody's off and isolated because that's the key. How do I isolate this child? How do I withdraw this child from the comfort of the people that love them? And how do I isolate them? The child whose baseball coach drives him or her home right? That time in that car is isolation Mm -hmm. and withdrawal, right? And so I would always ask, because there are coaches out there that are not doing this, right? So I I would always ask my child, so were you the last one to be taken home? Because that's another thing you want to pay attention to. If that child, how long is that child left alone? Mm -hmm. And if that child ends up being the last person taken home, you can easily say, well, drop them off at such and such a house and I'll come get them. Mm -hmm. So that there isn't an opportunity for that child to be alone by themselves with an individual individual that you might be a, feel a little sketchy about. Like I said, the sex registry, you can look up, hell, you can look my name up. If you want to know if the people in your area, who they are and where they live, the sex registry will absolutely tell you that. Yeah. And, and even just having this conversation, this like awareness of like, you have these tools available, like use them. You have the books, you have the internet nowadays, like use it and teach our children about this topic as early as you were saying four years old. Absolutely. I've, I've had earlier cases. I mean, because here's the thing, the sex registries are not updated for juveniles. It's a problem, but they are starting to put juvenile information in there. The thing that what I must be specific about is that a juvenile sex offender does not become a predator. So let me just start there. Oftentimes, juvenile sex offenders, it's about their curiosity and exploitation of a younger child or a girlfriend or boyfriend, right? And when we talk about the LGBTIQ community, we want to make it clear that If your child that's lesbian and you sense that because, you know, as much as parents like to ignore the signs that their child is bisexual or LGBTIQ, with intersex, that's clear. It's a biology piece that's clear. They're either born with different genitalia or they might have both testes and ovaries. And so that's clear. But sexual orientation, you can see as early as three years old. And so that makes a child vulnerable because people look at children who are LGBTIQ as vulnerable and they can get access because of it. I would also be cautious of people who talk about sexual things, show your children sexual things. That's not educational. And so, like I said, those conversations, you have to talk to your child about what's taking place when you're not around and and, and in the home as well. There's your brother. Yeah. We don't want to know that a brother may be sexually assaulting or a sister or a cousin, but those conversations have to be had every single time until your child knows, listen, I'm going to come to my mom and tell my mom about every event Mm -hmm. that I go to. So she's safe and feels comfortable that I can go back to see this person. The other thing, gifts, because understand grooming happens as a family. They don't just groom the child, they groom the family. Like I said, they bring wine to Christmas. They buy dinners. They're always available to pick up your child. Those are things that you want to pay close attention to. Mm -hmm. And those, anytime your child is away from you and somebody else was responsible for them, the conversations about what's going on, what kind of games you're playing. And if with outside of the home. And if they stutter or they step, I would always say, well, what is that? 
mean? And I always tell people because I'm a hypnotherapist, I must say as a talk therapist and a hypnotherapist, hypnotherapy is my favorite because it gets to the subconscious. And many people don't understand this theory also applies to victims because people repress it. And if they repress it, that means they d- deny the experience completely. And it comes up, it might be because they're too young. It might be because they went into shock when it happened. But if they deny that it happened and they repress it into the dark recesses of their mind and they never revisit again because it doesn't happen again, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And so they have these flashbacks later on when the mind is comfortable because your mind will save you. But what about the subconscious? What does that stomach say? If your stomach, can, I always tell parents, talk to your kids and ask them to give their body names. If that area of your body could talk to me, what would it say? And I make it as a game, right? You really have to get real comfortable, real comfortable with this topic that is looked upon as so taboo. This topic that you just don't talk about. You just don't look at. You just like, I'm going to be really transparent. The topic of sex was never talked about in my home. Like there was nothing ever, ever said about that. And so the fact that there are homes that this topic is never like discussed at all, we're doing such a disservice. To our kids. Absolutely. Right. Because the religious piece says that that's taboo. We don't talk about it. And we definitely don't talk about it with strangers. Mm -hmm. Definitely don't talk about it until it's age appropriate. I have parents who are constantly arguing with me about this is inappropriate. And I tell them, listen, you're not going to be there when your child is approached. Would you rather they have more information or less? Would you rather they know what to do or not? What they're saying is, is that that knowledge is not available to this child. And I promise you, you might not be paying attention, but that predator and that offender is making sure you did not have the discussion and that child is not savvy enough to know what to do. And so my niece is really good at saying, listen, I will go with you, but I don't like people touching me from the gate. Before we even know who, I don't like people touching me. So if you think that's me, right? But she she has a seven-year-old friend Mm. who has three online Instagram accounts and everybody thinks she's 16. Oh, wow. That was something else that I definitely wanted to talk about. Is that online targeting? She's tiny. Because that's the thing with online with our kids nowadays, getting their hands on, on technology and phones and wanting to be older than they are because it, they feel, I mean, heck, I wanted to grow up as fast as I could. I don't know why now. All of us do. <laughs> right? so, because they had more fun. They had more autonomy. They didn't have to do and, and follow every, every command. Yeah. Right? Be cautious of gifts too. People give gifts for silence. It's payment. So online, how can we protect our children online? So now we've protected them. We've talked about the awareness of the person who's coming through your house. So now we've got this online abusers, these online predators. Yes. So here's the problem, right? First, those parental locks need to be on the phone if you're going to give your child a phone. They can have an Instagram account. And so there are ways in which you can identify if your child has an account. Their little friends will tell you if they have an account, Mm -hmm. right? Because you can't go to Instagram and say, Instagram, you can't, or TikTok, you can't give an account to my child, right? Kids are finding a way around that. But if you go to their little friend circle and find out if they have an account, kids under pressure usually tell. And some of, like I said, this little girl has three accounts. She's seven. Her mother knows nothing about it. But my niece does since she's my niece. And I, I mean, sometimes you'll find her on my, because I'm making her an advocate, a peer advocate. But that's the other thing. We need parents to have peer advocates right? And so that is a good way in which this child gets the information. My niece comes on my Instagram lives and asks questions that are from her perspective, not mine, right? Because it's great information I can share, but really 
my niece was approached and didn't tell us my classmate when she was five years old didn't tell us until a year ago wow. how do we fight the battle if we don't know about it yeah give your child agency you give them control when you educate them mm -hmm. give them options when you educate them a child that has no conversation knows nothing about the topic sex is not discussed does not have the tools when they are approached because Again, if I say anything repeatedly, you will not be there. It doesn't matter. You will not be there. That sexual offender is telling your child to keep a secret. So the likelihood that they're going to tell you is slim, but they will tell their little friend. So when they're online, if you come across them online, then ask them, let me see that account because they're always online yeah. and don't allow them to change pages. And then look through the pages and through the history, okay? And so, yeah, that's 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 a violation of privacy, but the stakes are just too high. Yeah. And if they refuse to show you or allow you to have their phone at that time, then you take the phone and you get the password and you look through all the history. The history yeah. tells the tale and they're yes. not deleting history. Yeah, so as they get to. older, they can delete and they will delete history. They become very savvy, but you should also have a feed that downloads to your computer. So if weekly, you should have your child downloading to their computer. So that information and that history is there, right? We really so have to become have detectives. We have to become detectives and we have to be like, I'm almost saying, like, say, don't be overprotective. Don't be overbearing. You know what I'm saying? Like when you become a mom, this is the message that we're hearing. And Dr. Lisa, you're saying to us, like, we need to, we need be more to vigilant. be more vigilant because many, many kids are gamers, right? In fact, gaming is on YouTube. They are the most watched YouTubes, mm -hmm. okay? Not hair and makeup, it's gaming. And with gaming, you have the opportunity to connect with people outside the country and all over the world. And so it seems very innocent, but predators look for that, right? Where they have the opportunities to chat. And so I would have weekly conversations. Anybody chatting with you about sex on here? And it may be totally innocent mm -hmm. because they're 12 and there's some girl that's or a boy that's interested in them. But still, yeah, you need to monitor those conversations. And then even when your child is out of the house, there's we have what we call the red zone. Teens who get to college the first year between August and November are sexually assaulted at the highest rates. Freshmen. LGBTQI, as well as girls, highest wow. rates, the highest targeted rate of individuals are under 18. So what does that say to a parent? Exactly. You got to get them through their 18 years mm -hmm. and still worry about them at college. I mean, because I'm a college professor, I have students who are like, you're the only one I've ever told. I had an Uber driver arguing with me over R. Kelly and why she still plays his, his music, but she was sexually assaulted by her uncle. And she told me mm -hmm. and my mom in our car that she never told a soul. And I and my mother were the only person she never told anybody in the family. He had since died. I'm saying when you don't tell, you leave other kids vulnerable yeah. to be victims. Undetected off sex offenders are our issue because mm -hmm. we don't so how do we start to get comfortable with the discomfort, <laughs> like with the discomfort of talking about sex? So that topic is so taboo to even talk about with grownups. So how do we start to even get comfortable with ourselves? Like what can moms and parents do to start to help themselves to be able to have these conversations? Sure, sure. Okay, so let's start with the youngest, right? Four, five, six to nine. We talk about their body boundaries. You know, when they're younger, you can point to their butts, or I hope I can say that, or their private genital regions. And you say, has anybody touched you here this week that you didn't like? And so make them more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Touch their, you, you, you point to their breast males as well. You ask them, did anybody kiss you for a long time? Because sometimes it is so, it, it, it appears to be so innocent. Mm -hmm. It's a lingering kiss. And like an offender will test your child to see if they can. So did anybody touch you on your thigh 
And many predators, because we have this thing called maps where pedophiles talk to parents and they say, well, if, a, if my hand lingers too long on a leg or too high up under a skirt, then I know that I can do more the next time, mm -hmm. right? And so one of those things is about where is this person going to touch your child? If a person puts their hand on your leg and they're not washing you, washing your washing you, because you know, there's a lot of caregivers that wash children, but they also take advantage of a child in a bath because that child is smaller, they don't have the agency to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. If it lingers, the question is, is there anybody that you're around that you don't like who touches you? Right. So so those are the conversations we have to start talking about. But like I said, if you have children's books that cover it, mm -hmm. you can talk about the entire scenario and say, okay, so is there anybody who does this? And like I said, I have two books for five to nine-year-olds, but you can, and they've been tested by children because I always take my books to the target group mm -hmm. to see if they're afraid, to see if the content disturbs them enough that they don't want to read the book again. And so it has to be a book that parents don't have a problem reading to their children. And so I don't want to scare a child or parents. I just want them to know that these conversations are necessary yeah. and important so that your child does not become the statistics. One in four yeah. girls, one in six boys, and that is really much higher. Okay. So if that is true, so we're looking at one in three girls, you can pick three girls out of your family and see which one has been sexually assaulted. That is huge. And here's the thing. If you are, like you asked me, what are some other issues? Race. If you are African-American or Latinx and you've been sexually assaulted as a child or at any time, you are 35 times more likely to be sexually assaulted again. Many, many women, their first sexual experience was a sexual assault. So we have a lot of backtracking to do. But those parents who were suffering from trauma themselves and they still have all this anxiety and angst about it, I always say, use a subconscious method. Find a therapist who uses a subconscious method because that means that the triggers are still there. And most of the time, it's about giving that child the way you start the real healing process. Because, you know, sometimes it's surface. It's surface. We don't get to the meat yeah. and potatoes of the triggers. Our triggers are sensory. Smell, taste, touch, hear. That is so vital. Those are so important because you might smell the cologne 20 years later and automatically you're back in the trauma. The food you were eating at the time triggers you. That's subconscious. That subconscious memory you can't access with talk therapy. So find something that's sensory, that gets into the body. Your body's been with you all your life. It knows where it's stuffed it. Yeah, absolutely. But if you have anxiety, you have those ticks, you have, you know, your arm moves, you got these pains in your lower back and you haven't been doing anything strenuous. I always say, well, what memory is there? And if your lower back could talk to me, what would it say? Mm -hmm. And I tell people, if you can't afford some hypnotherapist, because I must admit they are expensive, write down a pain or a consistent ache on a post-it at night. Tell your body to tell you what's there, what's the memory there, what information do you, I, I give you permission to show it to me. Mm -hmm. And while you sleep, that work gets done because that's mm -hmm. the subconscious space. I tell people to do that just before they nap. Yeah, that's a beautiful practice. And thank you for sharing that with us because I do believe that the parent that is traumatized has the best intention of, not wanting that for their own child. And so I think the best thing you could do for your child, 100% is get your own work, do your own work, do your own Absolutely. healing. And, Absolutely. and I love that you're a hypnotherapist and talk about the subconscious mind where it's deeply buried. Because like you said, for me, it was working with the body. Once I found somatic embodiment work and somatic experiencing, that was the shift. Like I talked about my abuse for years but it never did, it never did much. It, I mean, it kept re-triggering each time you heard about it, each time you talked about it. But once you start getting into the body and start to feel safety again within mm. your body, 
That is the big, yeah, needle mover. Thank you so much for sharing that because that's important, right? Mm -hmm. Being safe, feeling safe. So even when I sleep, I I always tell myself, you're safe, you're protected, and I will never leave you, Mm -hmm. right? My inner child needs to know that I am her biggest warrior, rebel soldier. (laughs) And so that's why we often have to go back Because in hypnotherapy, we take them back to the moment of trauma because you made a decision then and your little self did not have all the tools. So Mm -hmm. that decision was quite primitive. And so we have to undo that decision. But sometimes that child needs to go back and tell that abuser, don't touch me. You did this because there's a lot of shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And that's what's preventing the healing, the shame and the guilt as if they could have helped themselves. And no, these offenders are bigger, they're smarter, they have more information, and they are exploiting you Mm -hmm. at every turn. So you couldn't have outthought them at six. You couldn't have outthought them at 12. You couldn't because they have more information. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So good. So much goodness. Like this conversation was so affirming that we have to keep doing the work on ourselves in order to raise resilient children. And you have a quote on your page that I found. I would love for you to share with us. You say it so well when taking the first step into darkness. Right, right, right. It's the Patrick Overton quote that you said, when taking the first step into darkness, you must believe two things will happen. It's either that you will have something to stand on or you'll have some, you'll be able to fly. Right, right. And so it's like this ledge leap and the net will appear. I know you're afraid for those of you out there that this has happened to and you're raising these beautiful, resilient children. I know you're afraid, but fear makes you brave. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take the step, nothing changes. And the question is for change, you have to act. And so finding this ledge, two things will happen. You must know that you will be given the wings to fly Mm -hmm. or that there will be a net to catch you. But either way, that fear means as you face it, you will have all the people that will surround you as that net, or you will be given the tools to fly. Yes. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I would just love for you to tell our audience, our listeners, where they can get in contact with you about the two books. I know we'll put this in the show notes, but it is nice to just have it voiced (laughs) and said. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can get in touch with me at right to consent. That's R I G H T, the number two, consent.com. And I also am on TikTok. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter at, at right to consent. And so you can find me anywhere. If you have any questions, I'm always available. And if you need to DM me, please do. But the two books that I have, one is called Aaliyah Can't Tell Her Secret. Now she's an old, she's older, but she is a next door neighbor of a friend who is having a party. And the other is Chad Keeps a Secret. Now this one is, was named after Chad with Bozeman because my niece was like, oh, you should name him Chad. And he had just passed. And so Chad is the one who's experiencing this sexual assault, but it's her, it's Chad's friends. In fact, it was two kids who decided this is not good. I'm going to tell my mom and this is how we're going to fix that. So in these books, I make the children superheroes Mm -hmm. because oftentimes the children are the ones who know about their friend who's being victimized and they often tell their parents Mm -hmm. and that's when the intervention happens. So we must make all kids peer advocates, if Mm -hmm. that's a good word, peer advocates for their friends, because they don't want to see their friends hurt. And like I said, if you happen to be a parent that thinks this topic is just not worthwhile, then please tell me, tell me what would make you more comfortable because the messages must be sent. This, This is not about religion and what this is not about introducing your children to sex this is not a, this is this is absolutely not that the offenders and the predators are waiting for you not to know i also have the blaming and shaming of defenseless victims that's for parents to learn about grooming and i will have a grooming webinar that will be up in the nu- in the next week wonderful wonderful thank you for sharing all that with us because we need it all all we of that you all. Can get it right <laughs> 
Yes. And I love the question at the end of the show, after everything that we've talked about, is there anything left on your heart that is unsaid that you feel needs to be said? Yes. Do not think this can't happen to your child. If you were to talk to your child today, I'm sure they've already been approached. So make it a topic that both of you are happy to talk about with Mm -hmm. one another, because in the end, it's It's you and them. It's you and them. And they don't want their bodies hurt. Trust and believe me. They don't want to be victimized. They are resilient, but they shouldn't have to be for this. Yeah, absolutely. Last thing, report, 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 report undetected offenders. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Lisa Smith, for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for your willingness to be so open and sharing such information that is so needed. And I just applaud the work that you're doing. And I applaud you for helping our children (laughs) because the world needs our children to thrive because that's the only way we're going to have a beautiful world is when our children are thriving. Right, Love and kindness is what we're talking about. Yes. Yes. 100%. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. And get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makewifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.